borders, close the camps. Now. Open the borders, close the camps. Now. Open the borders, close the camps. Now. Open the borders, close the camps. Open the borders, close the camps. Everyone in the community who was in touch with this gentleman, Bayan Anthony, attested that he was a torture survivor, yet he was sent back to Sri Lanka. Upon his return to Sri Lanka, he was interrogated for 16 hours by the notorious CID in the presence of Australian personnel who were there for his safekeeping, apparently. Dan Anthony came to Australia um, shortly following the end of the civil war in Sri Lanka. Uh, he is a Tamil, he's a Christian Tamil, um, and like so many other Tamils following the end of the civil war, he feared um, that the very fact of being a Tamil may lead to certain repercussions and harm to him if he remained in Sri Lanka. <laughs> When Dayan first arrived um, in Melbourne, he was taken shortly after the Maribyrnong Immigration Detention Centre. He was a survivor of torture and trauma in Sri Lanka. He had been detained several times by the notorious um, Criminal Investigations Department, or their CID. Um, he, his lower back was broken um, in what he described was an instance of assault, while in CID custody uh, with a rifle butt to his lower back. Australia. At the root of it all, of course, is the fact that still every single asylum seeker that comes to Australia exercising their lawful right to seek asylum is locked up indefinitely in hell holes like Maribyrnong Detention Centre. Um, he first applied to the Department of Immigration and then when he was refused a visa there, he applied to the Refugee Review Tribunal for review. Um, unfortunately, the Refugee Review Tribunal um, handed down a decision that confirmed the refusal of his protection visa. And thereafter, he made a series of personal requests to the Minister for Immigration. Um, the Minister didn't seem to look really deeply into Dayan's case, seeing from the face of it, that he was a Tamil, that he had gone to the Refugee Review Tribunal and that that was sort of enough for the Minister to say this has been looked at, this has been decided. Um, he was then handed a copy of the refusal of his latest ministerial intervention request and then 10 days later he was finally removed um, from Australia forcibly on a flight from Melbourne International Airport. What happened in Dayan's case, and we now know, is that commercial carriers are used to remove people. Um, in his case, Thai Airlines. Apparently Thai um, Airlines are habitually used to, for the removal of Sri Lankan um, returnees. They have no qualms. Um, he had two um, AFP officers accompanying him to secure him during the flight. Um, you know, interactions with him in Maribyrnong over the phone suggested that he already was being sedated in Maribyrnong to dull his resistance to what was about to happen. Um, so I, uh, my understanding was that he was kind of heavied onto the flight and he was transported amongst other commercial passengers. 
in a Thai Airways flight to Sri Lanka. His life is now in danger. He, I, from what I understand, he's not. Um, he, him, and his family are very fearful for their lives uh, and have gone into hiding. I think that they have real reason to be fearful. I know that when he arrived in Sri Lanka at Colombo Airport, he was handed over to the Sri Lankan intelligence and interrogated. So he was interrogated for 16 hours and then forced to give a press conference to recant any allegations of um, uh, that he'd made about being tortured in Sri Lanka and to say that you know everything was fine. Clearly a real, it's a circus uh, and that in and of itself is I think um, an indication of the fact that uh, his life is now in danger. <laughs> Conflict has not been resolved in Afghanistan. It has not been resolved in Sri Lanka. The war is officially over, but the absence of war doesn't mean peace. Um, and unless and until that happens, we will see people trying to seek protection. We get 0.51% of all asylum claims. 0.51%. We are way down the food chain when it comes to the the numbers seeking asylum. Uh, you know, in Pakistan you've got two million uh, ref refugees and asylum seekers. You've got a million in Iran. You've got, in one part of northern Kenya, you've got 375,000. You know, in Turkey, over three, between two and three thousand refugees arrive a day. If you, listen, if you were to go back 20 or 30 years and listen to the public discourse, you could guarantee we were probably, you know, we were living definitely in a society. Um, in the post-Thatcher, post-Reagan world, post-Howard world, increasingly we're living together in an economy. Now what makes that significant is this, if you live together in a society, you're a citizen. If you, if you are deemed to be living together in an economy, then you're a, you're a customer. Now the, the significance about this, if you live in a society, and if you are therefore a citizen, you have rights and you have responsibilities, you know, yourself and to each other. But if you're living in an economy and you're a customer or a consumer, all you have are choices based on how much access you've got to the readies. Where does that leave the refugee and the asylum seeker who bring so much gifts and talent and spirituality to the place? Where does it leave them? You're saying then we don't really have a spot for you.